All right. Now to a story about people not getting along. This is one that is really making some interesting rounds and it is it should be more of a bombshell than it has been. As in this story should have had, I think, wider play. And, and really, my hat is off to The Intercept as a uh, you know form of new media that, that's capable of getting a story like this out effectively. Secretly taped audio reveals Democratic leadership pressuring progressive to leave race. Now, I, I really do, before I present this, I have to point out how much I resent that there's a continuation of the bullshit left-right paradigm in so many fights about the media and fair coverage and crap like that. As a libertarian who has been getting screwed by YouTube since 2013, I was demonetized before it was cool, even right now. And by the way, we have a story about YouTube coming up here in a bit. You know, I, even now, just so uh, suppressed by YouTube. But, you know, conservatives get screwed on Facebook. That's big news because conservative has their, their media base. Uh, liberals get screwed in media in some form. I don't know when that happens, but whatever. That, you know, that makes, you know, whenever there's censorship or bias against liberals, you know, that's going to make big headlines. But when they pointed out like, oh my gosh, look, conservatives are getting censored, which, which you're ignoring is that libertarians exist in the first place and, and, and that we get censored at, at a far more effective scale. So I, I just say that to put the story in perspective because I want you to be listening to this, teasing out the implications. Steny Hoyer, the number two Democrat in the House of Representatives, has for years been a prolific campaigner on behalf of current and potential members of Congress. It was no surprise then that December found him in Colorado, where the party has hopes of knocking off Republican incumbent Mike Kaufman. Before Donald Trump had even been inaugurated, local resistance groups began deluging Kaufman's public appearances, pressing him not to repeal the Affordable Care Act and putting him back on his political heels. Levi Tillman, an author, inventor, and former official with the Obama administration's energy department, moved back home to make a run against Coffin. He focused his campaign on clean elections, combating climate change, Medicare for all, free community college, and confronting economic inequality and monopoly power. Another candidate for the nomination, Jason Crow, a corporate lawyer at the powerhouse Colorado firm Holland and & Hart and an Army veteran, meanwhile, appeared to have the backing of the Democratic establishment, though it wasn't explicit. In November, it became clear as Crow was named by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee to the party's red to blue list which the committee specifies is not an endorsement, but does carry symbolic weight. So, Levi Tillman, the Obama administration uh, official, former, versus Jason Crow, corporate lawyer. Now, with Hoyer in Denver, Tillman met the minority whip at the Hilton Denver downtown to make the case that the party should stay neutral in the primary, that he had a more plausible path to victory than the same centrism that Kaufman had already beaten repeatedly. So the reason this is a big opportunity, obviously, for the Democrats is that they have a Republican with tenuous holds on his base. Hoyer, however, had his own message he wanted to convey. Tillman should drop out. In a frank and wide-ranging conversation, Hoyer laid down the law for Tillman. The decision, Tillman was told, had been made long ago. It wasn't personal, Hoyer insisted, and there was nothing uniquely unfair being done to Tillman. He explained, this is how the party does it everywhere. Tillman had heard the argument from D.C. insiders and local Democratic bigwigs before, all of whom had discouraged him from challenging the establishment favorite. The only difference was that for this conversation, the candidate had his phone set to record. And you've heard me talk about this before. I highly recommend that everybody just set up their phones to automatically record every single phone call. You never know when it'll turn into a national story. The secretly taped audio recording released here for the first time reveals how senior Democratic officials have worked to crush competitive primaries and steer political resources, money, and other support to handpick candidates in key races across the country long before the party publicly announces a preference. The invisible assistance boosts the preferred candidate in fundraising and endorsements, and then that fundraising success and those endorsements are used to justify national party support. Meanwhile, opponents of the party's unspoken pick are driven into paranoia, wondering if they're merely imagining that unseen hands are working against them. So first implication here. Do you think the Republican Party does things any differently? No, of course not. This is part of the 
pyramid of power, of corruption that is created anytime you have such a grossly unjust central authority in existence at all, as with the United States federal government, there is going to be a, an oligarchy. Um, now, just to be clear, the term oligarchy, rule by the few, uh, is really the only form that government can take. Uh, even a monarchy, right, rule by a monarch. We say the monarch is the absolute ruler, owner, yada, yada, of the entire nation. They need a council. They need a group of supporters, a fellow elite of economic, social, financial, whatevers around them who are able to wield and maintain that power. So even in a monarchy, while described in technical terms as <clears throat> absolute rule by an individual, or family. In practice, it's an oligarchy. Democracy. Now, there's the bigger abstract definition of democracy as being ruled by the people. And I'm all for that. But it should be self-rule, right? Or no rulers. As in nobody gets to rule anybody else. But if it's ruled by the people, you could say that's the market. We allow things to be determined peacefully by everybody who interacts in the economy, in society, in any way whatsoever. That's the ultimate democracy. But when we say democracy is a government system based on majority voting, not only is that bad for minorities, yes, democracy is inherently bad for minorities, it's an excuse for the majority to force its will on the minority, at least that's one level of uh, deconstructing the, the myth of democracy. The next level is to understand that in practice, a democracy, because it does create a central institution of wielding power, ends up the same way as an oligopoly. Republic, yeah, another excuse for a specific kind of democracy, same shit. Socialism, communism, obviously, they all end up with a vanguard, a ruling class who effectively pull the strings in society because this central power authority exists. They have the ability to do this. So, when you have that kind of pyramid structure of any oligopoly, you are always going to have this gatekeeper effect. And even in the United States, in this great, vibrant democracy with free and fair elections, if you buy that marrow fantasy land, happy horse shit, I got a bridge to sell you. Excuse me, a crumbling government bridge to sell you. Probably somewhere in Michigan. But this is part of how it works. And the thing about the paranoia, um, it, it doesn't help to get paranoid when you know that this is happening, even when you can't see it. And so I, I kind of want to point out to, to fellow libertarians that if the Republicans and Democrats uh, invest, I mean, so much that they have a senator, a sitting senator, going around and pulling the strings in the system, discouraging people from running, of course, of course, it's in their interest to send infiltrators into the Libertarian Party to do the same thing or to have the same effect, to be, to be able to, to manipulate the Libertarian Party into ineffectiveness. Now, again, I, I don't mean to be paranoid here, uh, but a certain amount of just understanding, precaution, and awareness is, is not only appropriate, but essential to just keep, just keep your sanity. If, if you're involved in this game, if you're following this at all, if you're playing along, uh, because you know that there, there are forces working against freedom. That's why we have uh, the, the government that we enjoy today. And if, if I was being, you know, paranoid on, on the extreme, you know, I could look at the, the, the more uh, unlikely scenarios, although I think it is likely that there are also government plans within the freedom movement. Uh, in fact, we, can, we, we know that for a fact from the case of Morpheus Titania, Thomas Costanzo, whose story we covered a couple of weeks ago, who was the Bitcoin trader in Phoenix who had uh, three undercover agents and an undercover uh, narc uh, informant uh, testify at his trial coming out they're doing i mean they're they're infiltrating undercover in the open as in they're not ashamed of it they do it when it comes time to prosecute all right well we'll prosecute we'll testify so i mean there are some sort of silly hypotheticals you can bring into this that oh it's it's all mk ultra using mind control against our candidates and making people in our movement go crazy and certainly would explain a lot if the government was operating at that level but it's probably not necessary they're probably able to what they think is rendering the Libertarian Party ineffective or at least slowing us down as much as they can with more subtle means. Things like this. 
Hoyer bluntly told Tillman that it wasn't his imagination and that mobilizing support for one Democratic candidate over another in a primary isn't unusual. Representative Ben Ray Lujan, who I ran against in 2010, and if it wasn't for the Republican Party's bullshit, I would have had a chance at unseating him. Ben Ray Lujan, Democrat of New Mexico, chair of the DCC, representing New Mexico's third district, the northern third of the state, has a policy that early on, this is quote, policy that early on we tried to agree on a candidate who we thought could win the general and give the candidate all the help we could give them. Not letting, you know, Democratic primary voters decide. So, yeah, if you're a Democratic primary party voter, just know that the leadership of the party that you claim to be a member of don't care about you or your vote. As Hoyer explained, yeah, I'm for Crow. I am for Crow because a judgment was made very early on. I didn't know Crow. I didn't participate in the decision, but a decision was made early on by the Colorado delegation, he said, referencing the three House Democrats elected from Colorado. So Tillman asked her in the conversation, so your position is a decision was made very early on before voters had a say, and that's fine because the DCCC knows better than the voters of the 6th Congressional District, and we should line up behind that candidate. Hoyer responded, that's certainly a consequence of our decision. Ah, the politics of this. These guys are slick. Staying out of primary, sorry, Hoyer said, staying out of primary sounds small, deep, democratic, very intellectual, and very interesting. But if you stay out of primaries and somebody wins in the primary, you can't possibly win in the general, the Maryland representative said. Citing the surprise victory of Democrat Doug Jones over Republican Roy Moore in the Alabama Senate election. I'm not saying you're that person, but staying out of primaries, he argued, is not a very smart strategy. And that's the excuse. Now, that's actually legitimate. If you're a political party trying to gain political power, yes, it is strategically legitimate for you to subvert democracy. The funny thing about this is that, it, you, first of all, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be seeking political power in the first place, but that this is the excuse that they use for the real corruption going on here. This is how they get a worse candidate elected, by getting them more money, by corrupting them early on, by making sure that they will toe the party line and support all of the policies assumed by Democratic Party sponsors. The military industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industry, the public sector union lobbies, all, all of these corrupt groups, all the corporatism that feeds this corruption. It's to bring only their, it's like, a, it's like part of, it's like a pre-initiation into a cult. You can only get to the next level if you, if you prove that you're gonna be uh, Good company man. Before agreeing to provide the audio, Tillman requested that personal details be withheld. The Intercept selected the newsworthy aspects of the recording for publication. During the conversation, Hoyer asked Tillman to leave the race multiple times and make way for Crow. Quote, you keep saying I would like you to get out of the race, and of course that's correct. The party notably has a poor track record in selecting candidates that can win the general election. In 2006, the last cycle viewed as a wave midterm election for Democrats, the DCCC famously became heavily involved in Democratic primaries. In that election, just as in 2018, the party attempted to pick moderate, business-friendly veterans while nudging left-leaning candidates out of the election. But some of the party's chosen primary candidates ended up losing, and several candidates viewed as too progressive to win the general election in Republican-held districts, such as John Hall, Carol Shea Porter, and Jerry McNerney, went on to win that election with little to no DCCC support. Now... <clears throat> I gotta say, I gotta look up. Who's who is writing this for the intercept? This is Lee Fang. Now it's funny, Lee here seems to be holding on to uh, a, a certain delusion of the left himself, giving the Demo like giving the Democratic Party the benefit of the doubt that their story is true. That the only reason they're manipulating these elections is to make sure that the Democrats win. No bullshit absolute bullshit they are doing this for all of the same reasons that motivate them in their corruption to serve the corporate special interests that drive the american electoral process this is something that that really i'm i'm excited that that this is happening i'm really excited that this i mean we talk a lot about you know, these shifts of progress. This would not have been possible without the technology, being able to just record a phone call. Now, I know we've had that around for a while, 
but that we were able to get the story out that the intercept existed as a media outlet that the internet was there to spread the story that republicans were able to jump on it conservatives people who anybody who's an enemy of the democratic party libertarians were able to get on this and spread it and say look you need to know the average american aside if, if you don't already know that the political system is rigged bullshit designed to take advantage of you that there's this whole other layer of manipulation that prevents honest candidates from even running and i i hope you know uh, and I, I want to be inclusive in the Libertarian Party, of course. I, I, I hope that, you know, in at least races where the, the Libertarians don't have a serious candidate, that, that I, you know, I'd rather have an honest Democrat come and run. And I, I say this as someone who, uh, you know, decries Governor Bill Weld's statism, trying to claim that he's a Libertarian, but I, I'd still rather him, you know, I, although I don't know about Bill Weld. I'm actually really confused about Bill Weld right now. Um is he coming around or is it more bullshit political pandering from someone who's been dishonest in the past? Hard to say. But I think most of these candidates who run on principle, who run for their beliefs, who are not necessarily career politicians but are getting pushed out by the Democratic Party, would do better to look at the, the Libertarian Party. And I'm very confident that if they are as well-intentioned as, as they claim to be, that, that when they're exposed to the libertarian message and they go, oh, that's ethics, oh, that's universal nonviolence, oh, that's just being a good person, that they'll be libertarians very quickly. For the 2018 midterm cycle, the party has not only courted moderate Democrats and formed a renewed partnership with the conservative Blue Dog Caucus for candidate recruitment, but has discouraged candidates from embracing populist ideas, such as single-payer health care. It's funny because I, I wouldn't be surprised if Donald Trump actually beat him to that. For Tillman, however, the party's closest with the corporate elite is the very reason why the DCCC continues to lose general elections. At, quote, they squash progressive candidates. They destroy the diversity of ideas in their caucus. They keep ideas like Medicare for all, free community college, or impeaching Donald Trump from having a significant role in the national conversation. The issues that resonate most with voters are not the issues that the DCCC is telling candidates to focus on. The, and the effect of this is the run to the center. And it's not like the center is in the moderate center. It's like the, the, the center of the corruption between Democrats and Republicans because they get, to, uh, they, they get to have a synergistic effect here because the money for all these central organizations, the DCCC, the, the R, they have a slightly different acronym, whatever the heck it is, you know, the Republican uh, you know, money machine, they're all taking money from the same fundamental sources. Is he worried that even if he is successful in his campaign that he's already betrayed one of the most powerful Democrats, making him an outsider as soon as he arrives in Washington? Quote, To a certain extent, people like Elizabeth Warren, people like Bernie Sanders have been ostracized by the party and they have been marginalized by the establishment to the extent that is possible. But the fact of the matter is that the people are crying out for genuine leaders and the people are crying out for a solution to inequality and systemic injustice and to the extent that I am fighting for those solutions then I think there will be a powerful constituency for that. I'm proud to be on the side of truth. I'm proud to be on the right side of democracy. And I'm proud to be on the right side of free and fair elections. Now, Mr. Tilleman, <laughs> you are still on the wrong side of so many things. But I'm glad that you mentioned Bernie Sanders here and, 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 and even Elizabeth Warren. Because when I watched the Bernie Sanders campaign, I saw not just a silver lining, but a, a big, beautiful silver cloud and I'm not talking about the gray hairs that came out for Bernie. No, because it was young people. It was people who were looking for something fundamentally different that most, because Bernie would have won. Bernie should have won. Bernie did win. He had it stolen from by Clinton, obviously. Is that the thing about what he illuminated was that most people who identify as Democratic voters in the primary are willing to vote for someone who calls himself a socialist. You know, it's a Democratic socialist, whatever. We already live in a socialist country anyway, so it doesn't matter. But that the conversation itself is being so stifled by the Democrats and Republicans through this kind of manipulation of the voting process, keeping out, and, and, and if I use their terms, it would be keeping out extreme candidates, keeping out fringe candidates, keeping out, you know, fringe candidates. But the reality is that they're keeping out grassroots candidates. They're keeping out candidates with a legitimate base of popular support. They're keeping out candidates who are anti-establishment and the effect is more establishment. I think it's a very important way to understand how the system works to squash those voices.
Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your post and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.